Hello everyone, welcome to Gypsy Jazz Friday's episode 15, I believe. And for today's episode, I have something quite different from what I usually do. Today, it's a top five tips to improve your rhythm playing versus a top five things to avoid during rhythm playing. Or you could also say a top five do's versus a top five don'ts when it comes to rhythm playing. Let's do this. If you're new to Gypsy Jazz Guitar rhythm playing, you might want to watch my complete tutorial about how to play Gypsy Jazz Rhythm first, and there's a link to that video in the description, and then you can come right back to this video and get some additional tips. Of course, I want to say that everything I'm saying in this video is just based on my opinion, on my experience, might be very far from the truth, might be totally wrong, uh, but at least you know where I stand in all of this. Before we start though, I want to share something with you that I have discovered in the statistics of my YouTube channel. I have found that most people that watch my videos are actually not subscribed. So if you enjoy my videos and are maybe a regular viewer, why not subscribe, like the video, press the bell icon, all the good stuff that you can do to help a YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. If you want to support me even more, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that in the description. You'll get access to tons of exclusive videos and you can download tons of sheet music from there as well. Let's start with the top five do's, the top five tips to improve your rhythm playing. Number five is to create embellishments through movement instead of alternate rhythms. So what I mean is, instead of embellishing your rhythm playing with stuff like this, stuff that can really disturb the flow of the rhythm, it can also sound nice, don't get me wrong, but instead of focusing on developing that skill, focus on moving the chords around. So let me give you three examples. Let's say we're playing Sweet George Brown. Now that's gonna be E7 four bars to A7 four bars to D7 four bars to G. If I would play straight, it would sound like this. One, two, three, four. Now, three things that you could do is, before a chord change, you could anticipate the next chord with a chord one fret up. So when I go from E7 to A7, I'm gonna play B flat seven, two beats before I change to A7. So it's gonna sound like this. One, two, three, four. Let's do the same to D7. E flat, D. Now to G. That's one thing you could do. The second thing you could do is when you have a chord that lasts at least two bars, and in, in this song it's even four bars, you could shift the chord back and up again. So let's say we have E7, and in the second bar I'm gonna do this. One, two, three, four. Let's do it with A7. D7. Back, up. G7. The third thing you could do is, if you have a one chord, like G6 in this song, you could hop back and forth between the one and the five chords. So I have G, instead of doing just G, I could do G, D, G, D, G, or just once, like G, D, G. So now let's play one chord of Sweet Richard Brown, and I will use all of these things when I think it's appropriate. One, two, one, two, three, four. Now when I'm doing this, I'm trying to vary the kind of embellishment I'm making and the amount of embellishments. And I don't want to do the same thing every chord change. So this would take some practice, some experience and taste. But I think this is a much better route to creating interesting rhythm than focusing all your attention to all the rhythmic variations. You should do that too, but start with creating interesting rhythm through 
chord movement. Let's go to the number four tip to improve your rhythm playing. Focus on the low strings with every beat. Now, of course, on beat one and three, you're gonna hit less strings than on beat two and four, right? On one and three, I'm gonna maybe hit two or three strings. And on beat two and four, I might hit four strings, maybe five strings. That's not the point. The point is that I focus my attention to the low strings, even if I'm not fretting a note. If I'm playing, let's say I'm playing this G6 without the bass, and this low E string is muted, I'm still trying to focus my right hand on those strings. And it's not a precise technique in the sense that you should hit a certain amount of strings. It's more just focusing on those strings and not really caring about the highest two strings. And to demonstrate this, let me play the first half of the tune, Hungaria, focusing on the low strings, the way I like it. And then the second half, I'm gonna focus on the high strings and you can hear the difference. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> I hope you could hear that the second half sounds much weaker. The rhythm sounds like it has no more grounding. It loses all its body. And the one thing I want to create is body to be a warm bath for the solo player. That's why I like focusing on the low strings versus focusing on the high strings, or better said, focus on the low strings and don't care about the high strings. Okay, the number three tip to improve your rhythm playing is to focus on beat two and four in such a way that there's a slight accent. In technical terms, that just means that you should have a little bit more sweep in your right hand on beat two and four, as opposed to one and three. Right, one and three is just... And two and four, I'm just making a larger movement. I don't want it to be something like you have to hit these exact amount of strings. Just focus for this tip on the movement. Just a little bit more sweep on two and four so that there's an accent, so that it sounds like this. Set off. Now this is a very important tip, especially when you play rhythm for a long time and you kind of start losing your enthusiasm for it, let's say, or you get tired, or maybe you don't know that song very well, there's some really difficult chord changes. If you keep the focus on beat two and four and keep that swing going, because that's a major part of the swing feel of the gypsy jazz rhythm, if you just keep that sound on the two and four going, the soloist will always feel supported in the right way. And especially when the song gets very fast, let's say you play Cherokee and it's very fast, this focus on two and four will keep the rhythm swinging. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> I was trying to move uh, the chords around a lot this last part, and that can be difficult, right? You, you, you could maybe miss uh, the exact strings that your fingers have to land on, but if you keep this two and four thing going, it will always work. So that's a, a major tip, and it's something that I say to myself too when I have to play rhythm for a long time. I try to focus on the two and four. Now, it shouldn't be the case that you really start not hearing the one and the three anymore, like this. You don't, want, you don't want to do that, but you want to make a difference between beat two and four and beat one and three. The number two tip to improve your rhythm playing is to practice with a metronome and in a very specific way. Of course, you could do the normal things by putting the metronome on all four clicks and then maybe beat one and three and beat two and four, or maybe only beat one or maybe beat two. But I'm talking about a specific metronome practice that I also talked about in other videos about rhythm. It's when you play along with a good recording, let's say you're playing along with uh, Django, with maybe you're playing along with Limehouse Blues. Before you start playing along, get your metronome, start tapping with the metronome app to see what the tempo is they're playing it at, at the start of the song. Then do the same thing for the final part of the song, maybe the last chorus, and see what the difference in tempo is. It, it's always gonna be a little bit different. Let's say they start Limehouse Blues at 280, I'm not sure what the tempo is, but let's say 280 BPM, 
the start of the of the song and then the final chorus you find it's 283 or 284. You notate that, you can forget all about it. Now you're gonna start playing along with the original recording and you can do it for a long time. Let's say for 20 minutes straight, you're just playing along with the original recording, really loud so that you really have the feeling that you're playing in a band and you're doing the best you can, start playing with that band. After you feel confident, it's time to take the test. So you're gonna go to the metronome, you're gonna put it on 280, see what the tempo is, turn the metronome off, have the tempo in your head, start playing and, and record yourself, that's important, record yourself for the exact amount of choruses that the original recording was. Let's say the original recording is eight chorus. So for eight choruses, you're gonna do this, imagining yourself playing with the recording or playing in a band. Then you're gonna listen back to yourself and you're gonna notate your metronome marks from the beginning and the end. Now maybe let's say you started at 280 and you ended at 290. Now you know that you were speeding up too much. That's not acceptable because you were practicing with Django and the band of Django was only speeding up four beats. And that's a very good way to start getting very solid when it comes to tempo. Start playing along with your favorite albums and start doing this practice and I will promise you this will be a massive boon to your steadiness as a rhythm player. The number one tip to improve your rhythm playing is to focus on playing short. And with short, I mean really short. Now, I know there is tons of people that play long rhythm or longer rhythm and it sounds really good. But this is a tip, especially for people that are still getting to grips with getting a good rhythm sound. In the beginning, it's very important that you start learning short strokes because that kind of rhythm is the least intrusive to a solo player. What you want is to gain lots of experience playing rhythm for good players. And good players might have their preferences. One might like this kind of sound, another one might like another kind of sound. But in my experience, no one really objects to this short rhythm style because it's not intrusive. And if you can be a player that is not considered to be intrusive to a solo player, you get lots of opportunities to play rhythm and then you can work on various aspects that are very important, but start developing that short rhythm sound. So, I mean, like this. As opposed to... Or whatever you can think of. There's a couple of things that go into playing this short. The first thing is to half mute all the chords. That means I don't press the strings completely down, right? The chord will never sound like this, but it's always something like this. So I press very lightly and I let go immediately after my big hit the strings. The second aspect is that there is no focus on upstrokes whatsoever. So don't focus on upstrokes in the beginning of your rhythm career, because focusing on the upstroke is going to mess you up. The, the upstroke should be something that evolves gradually when you're already very good at playing no upstrokes. Or it might not, because you don't really need the upstroke to have good rhythm. That's the second aspect. And the third aspect of playing short is in your ears. It's listening to yourself and recognizing if you are actually doing it. Many people change chords with a long chord. So for instance, they're playing minor string and it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. I hope you noticed that I was changing chords with a long chord every time. So this would be not playing short. Of course you can change uh, chords with a long chord sometimes, but in general you should be focusing on making all the chord changes with a short stroke, like this. One, two, three, four. Now there is one other aspect that can really help you get this kind of sound and I talk about that of course in my rhythm tutorial video and that is by creating the sound not only with the pick but by a combination between the pick and your fingernails. And I don't want to get into the details of that. Watch uh, my rhythm tutorial video and I'll, I'll explain it in detail. That was the top five tips to improve your rhythm playing. Let's go to the top five things to avoid during rhythm playing. The number five thing to avoid is to play 
too loud. And my guess is that some of you probably would have expected me to put this on number one, but my top five things to avoid goes from things that are easy to fix to things that, are, that take more effort to fix. So number five is easy to fix, just play less loud. Whatever it is that you have to do, maybe you have to hit less hard, maybe you have to move the place of your right hand, maybe you have to mute the strings more with your left hand. It could be many things, but it's mostly in your ears. Listen to yourself in relation to the rest of the band. Also listen to some Django recordings. For instance, listen to my suite and notice how soft the rhythm is compared to Django. Now I'm not saying that every song should be like that, but in general, it should be your aim to create supportive, but not intrusive rhythm. And one of the things that can be really intrusive is playing way too loud. The number four thing to avoid during rhythm playing is to press too hard. I was already talking about that previously, but there's another reason for me to put it here. And that is, if you press too hard, you will get tired very fast, especially during very fast tunes. But the other thing is this squeezing motion is actually not very healthy for you to do with a lot of force, especially if you are a dedicated rhythm player with many gigs, you might run the risk of actually injuring your hand. So just don't press too hard. Realize that you don't have to make the chords voice in such a way that all the notes are very audible. You can half mute, right? It's where you just press the strings just enough so that you can feel the neck under your fingers, but not more than that. The chords will sound like this. Extra benefit is that probably your rhythm will sound a little bit softer also. The number three thing to avoid during rhythm playing is consistent embellishments. And this means that you have a kind of rhythmic pattern where you play a certain embellishment at regular intervals. The most famous one would be this one. Let's play all of me. One, two, three, four. So I'm doing this every two bars and you might think it sounds funny, but uh, you can't believe how many people actually do this. Now, maybe not every two bars, but maybe they do it every four bars and then there's a couple of uh, two bars in a row that they might be doing it and it's just part of their rhythm sound, but that shouldn't be part of the rhythm sound. That's an embellishment, which you should maybe do once every chorus, maybe twice, not more. So it's again, it's a matter of listening to yourself. Is this part of your rhythm playing? Is this something that you do automatically? Then you should get rid of it and just avoid all consistent embellishments. Even the moving the chords around shouldn't be the same thing every time. You shouldn't change every chord with a half step above. You have to be able to vary it and you also have to be able to not do it. And the trick to it is to be aware of everything you're doing. The number two thing to avoid during rhythm playing is to think that you can stop the turning of the pick by finding another pick that doesn't turn or having different picks for different tempos or a different pick for soloing and another pick for a rhythm. You should be able to play anything you want with the same pick and just accept that in the beginning your pick will turn. I have seen too many people complaining about this or asking me for help because the pick keeps turning. I can tell you a secret. The pick turns for everyone, but it will start turning less and less the more you practice with the same pick. For instance, right now I'm playing with a, a Wegen Big City pick. I just got used to how to hold it, where to put it uh, on my finger, and this will be different for every pick. But as soon as you start messing around with a lot of different picks or with different sides for different things, you will only make it more difficult for yourself and you will probably never be able to cure this problem. So take a pick that you think sounds good, that feels good, and just start woodshedding, playing all the time, noticing when your pick turns, and you might even have to re-grip it. You can do a break, right? You, maybe the pick turns. You... And then you re-grip it, and then you go on. I mean, that's fine. You will notice that if you stick with the same pick and become good with that pick at everything, it will be less and less of a problem but it will never go away. That's just the truth. I've talked to many top players and for them, the pick might also turn. The number one thing to avoid during rhythm playing is to mess up the form. And this might seem like an easy thing, but it actually isn't because it's so easy to lose the form, especially when you have a ABAA -A -A, like Coquette or I Got Rhythm or Lulu Swing. You have this A, B, A, A, and then there's again A. So there's three A's in a row. Now you all know this, but 
it happens so often that you lose count, so you start playing A, B, A, A, B. Now, why is this so important to avoid? For, for several reasons, but the most important thing is that it will really mess up a solo player, because a good solo player will be looking ahead to things he could be playing to go to the bridge. So, if all of a sudden you go to the bridge, when he didn't play a line that specifically goes to the bridge, you really will mess up the flow of his solo, and he will be very annoyed, especially when this happens over and over again. So, there's a couple of ways to work on this. The most obvious way would be, again, to play along with your favorite recordings. And be very aware of where you are in the form all the time. But if you make a mistake now, you will immediately hear it because the recording will be correct. Another strategy I found that really helps is to say to yourself at the beginning of a song, to say to yourself top, because it's the top of the chorus, right? Or say now or something. And be aware when you say it. So let's say you're playing Luda Swing, so you're in the bridge, G. I'm saying to myself now, right? And then I know, okay, this is the top of the chorus, so I have to play two A's. It's just a matter of being aware of where the top of the chorus is to not mess up the form. Because if you start messing up the form once, it's gonna happen more often because now everybody's confused. The bass player might not hear it, the solo player might not hear it, and it can become a big mess. I think it's actually the responsibility of the rhythm player to be aware of the form at all times, even more so than the bass player. Because if the bass player makes a mistake, he can probably still recover, because he can hear the rhythm player not going to the bridge, so he will just adapt, and there will be one wrong bass note. But if the rhythm player goes to the bridge too early, the whole band actually has to change. Probably the rhythm player has already played four beats of the first chord of the bridge. That's why it's very important to not mess up the form and to really work on this. This was it. Top 5 do's versus top 5 don'ts. I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, again, this is just my opinion, my experience. Might be very far from the truth. You might disagree with me and that's fine. Then put your tips in the comments because we can all learn from that. I hope I will see you in the next video. Bye.